Welcome back with my ranking of all Kate Bush albums. Kate Bush is one of my all-time favorite pop artists ever. Um, I'm doing this also because uh, a couple of weeks ago I I listened to an interview she gave BBC in, in like September this year where she hinted at a new album. You know, her last album, um, 50 Words for Snow, came out in 2011. So that's 13, 14 years from now. Uh, so it's really for fans, it's big news. Um, when, and you know, when, when Kate Bush hints at something, that usually means she's right in the middle of doing it. So I'm, I'm hoping for, and you know, because of that interview, it's also realistic that maybe next year we'll get a new Kate Bush album. And you know, that of course would be awesome to get a new album from this phase in her, her life. Um, that's that's really special. Um, so I thought um, with if this I was inspired to re-listen to her entire catalog and, and make a ranking. And since she doesn't have as many studio albums as other artists that are active for more, more than 45 years now, I think she has like 10 studio albums. I also um, going to include um, sites things like live albums, live EPs, um, and, 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 and miscellaneous other stuff. You, you will see what I mean uh, now. Um, because we start with number 13, um, which is one of those not really studio album kind of things. It's, you know, it's the last place, it's number 13, because it's just four tracks. Um, but you know, this ranking is like ranking every song she ever officially released under her name somewhere. Uh, so I also had to include this because those first so four songs were only available on this and on a VHS, but you know, we're not going to rank VHSs here. Um, this is an EP from 1979, maybe it was released in 1980, but it's from live performances from her tour of life, which she did in 1979. You know, it was really the only tour she ever did. So it's a very fitting name to call it Tour of Life because it's the only tour of her life. Um, she also had a, a live residency in 2013, um, which was released later, you know, more on that later, on a separate live album. Um, but that wasn't really a tour. That was just like 20 concerts in one uh, location. But this was really a tour, a tour of Europe, UK and Europe. And, you know, it's nice, but it has to be number 13 in this ranking because it's just four tracks. Um, but, you know, it's good. Even my least favorite um, Kid Bush release um, is good. You know, there isn't really, there, there are no stinkers in this catalog, um, one has to say. Uh, the next one is another of those side things. Um, it's called Director's Cut. It's from 2011. Um, released like a half a year before her la last proper studio album, 50 Words for Snow. So we have to be thankful for this record, even if we maybe not enjoy it as much as some of her other work. But this kind of inspired her, you know, this, this kind of woke her up to, to make a new album, you know. Um, she, she compiled this album, she, she recorded this album, and during, during that, she she started having ideas for this other album, 50 Words for Snow. So 50 Words for Snow wouldn't exist without Director's Cut, but what is Director's Cut? Um, director's Cut is, uh, first of all, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of a brave, a bold, a typical Kate Bush unusual move. It's um, re-recordings. It's... Um, uh, tracks from two of her albums but re-recorded with new vocals and also um, even new instruments added and in one or two cases it's really completely redone you know a, a new version of existing songs so it's not really a new studio album in that sense but it's part of her official catalog um, and the songs of this album um, are remix from two albums, like I said, The Sensual World from 1989 and 1993's Blood Red Shoes, because um, she wasn't that happy uh, with the original versions of, of these songs. That was the, the impetus from, for making Director's Cut. Um, I can see why, in a way, um, 
more on those other albums later. Um, I think the understanding was that those two albums, you know, one from the late 80s, one from the early 90s, that they suffer from, you know, the production spleens of, of that era, one might say, you know, many artists um, had, you know, like a dark face in the late 80s, early 90s uh, because of the production things that were happening at the time, you know, the big gated drums and then this AOR kind of boring rock, but, but you know, more on those albums later, I don't, I don't think so, and that's also the reason, in, in Kate Bush, I don't think that those late 80s, early 90s albums are a week, I think even the production is really important for them also to, you know, function as a kind of a time capsule, and, you know, all those, those 80s production crimes with Kate Bush, they, you know, they, they they don't they, they don't bother me they they, they really they all, all almost enhance her work they really fit together perfectly so that's the reason why this is number twelve in this ranking because I think in most cases um, it's uh, eleven songs four from the sense of world and the rest from Blood of Juice in most cases I prefer very much so the original versions but you know it's an interesting listen. Um, Number 11, so now this is the, my least favorite of the real official studio albums of Kate Bush. It's uh, 1978's Lionheart, her second album in 1978. Like in 2011, um, she, she put out two albums, you know, she often took her time with, with between releases, um, but in the early stages of her career, she really put them out quickly in quick succession. That was also because she had a real a huge backload of al of albums uh, of songs. Um, she started writing songs properly in the early seventies, and so she had you know she had enough material. Um, though most of the songs of this album were newly written at the time, but I think she probably took a melody here, a lyric there from maybe pre-existing songs in some cases. It's a fine album, you know. There's no such thing as a weak Kate Bush album in my opinion. Any other artist I could think of, it would be virtually impossible to have this at the bottom of my favorite studio albums or least favorite studio albums. It's an excellent album. It's of its time and maybe that's one of the reasons why she and I were not so fond of it in comparison to the others because she wasn't yet that independent artist in the sense that she could do whatever she wanted to do. I mean, EMI, her label, from the beginning gave her lots of freedom because they could see what a special artist she she is, uh, was and is. Um, but compared to what she would do from, especially from starting with the fourth album where she really could do whatever the fuck she wanted, she still had to, you know, oblige to some kind of unwritten rules of recording and it still sounds like a 70s album with you know band sound um, it's, 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 I would say it's like an art rock art rock slash folk album um, but some highlights here I mean the, it starts off with, with Wow, one of her big early classics and there are a couple of other really nice songs on there, so very good album uh, at 10 we have the next special or let's say not studio album release in, in this ranking video it's uh, Before before the Dawn and that was her second live or that, that is her second live album or her only live album because like I said on stage is just an EP um, this is really this makes up for, for the lack of tracks on, on stage uh, more, than, more than, than, than it would have needed because this is a triple album which runs for more than three hours. It's, I don't know, it's 25 to 30 songs and it's fantastic, you know, it's, that, that's from her comeback. Like I said, I wouldn't say tour because it was just in one location um, at the Apollo in, in, in London. Uh, but this was, you know, after more than 30 years without concerts, maybe she did one of, like, performances, live performances of, of individual tracks, also in the 80s, um, there's that great video of her doing Running Up the Till with Dave Gilmore from, like, 87, 88, but she never did full-length concerts after, after that, in 1979, so that was 
it was a very surprising and, and, and welcome uh, thing when she announced she's, she's going to do that and it's fantastic you know uh, there's one video at least I know of one video on YouTube um, which you know she forbid to to film uh, for, for the audience so those are like people who ignored what she wanted uh, who ignored it and, and filmed with, with their cell phones with their mobile phones cloud busting the performance of cloud busting uh, so it's a an edit of various audience people with their mobile phones filming it so it's not really professional quality but it's probably my favorite live video on YouTube because it's so exclusive because only the people here in the audience and you know only the people in the audience uh, knew what that looked like and it was really a big theatrical kind of show and I, I love that live version of cloud busting and also that there's this video of her doing it she she filmed it professionally this this uh, concert uh, thing before the dawn but she never put it out yet maybe maybe in the future she'll put it out um, but you know that would be really magnificent to have the full length concert professionally filmed um, yeah it's like I said it's fantastic um, it's mostly or it's only material from after after that period so that there are no like overlapping songs um, which she already did in, the, in, in 1979 it's, it's mostly it's songs from Hounds of Love and from Ariel but also a couple of songs from Blood Red Shoes and, and the other albums of course it's, it's fantastic so it's number 10 out of 13 albums and it's, I al already I'm saying it's fantastic and it's you know it's really it's really fantastic it's, it's wonderful live triple album number nine again not really a official studio album I went for uh, go for the other sides uh, which came out I think in 2018 which includes not all but most of her b-sides and you know special mixes which I'm not that keen on you know like long elongated 12 inch mixes for, for hits but the real cool stuff on here is, is the b-sides um, the b-sides were also available on these CDs that are really very hard to get these days um, that was released on a box set uh, in 1990 called this woman's work um, but I think this is more comprehensive but there's there's a lot lots of overlap between these two releases and and this uh, for at least as a listening experience I enjoy this more but this which is like I said very hard to get these days is mostly the same or in, in many cases the same and you know she, she, she really did brilliant b-sides um, uh, what is my favorite of, of those I'd say probably Under the Ivy um, which is a great song and which is also the title of, of her biography so it's not an official authorized biography but it's a really very res respectful and greatly researched biography um, and that, that book is also called Under the Ivy which is really a great read especially if you're a fan of Kate Bush of course um, yeah those are the b-sides as my number nine great 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 b-sides and uh, number eight is uh, in my opinion most underrated album ever and maybe also one of the most underrated album albums of the 90s so by now uh, Kate Bush fans know which album it is because it's the only album she did in the 90s it's Blood Red Shoes, I only have it on CD because 1993 that was the year when CD took over and you know vinyl to get vinyl now from that era is really expensive and you know it also has this CD sound so it's really this is one of those albums where it really makes sense to listen to it on, on CDs it was really the era when things were made for CD more than for vinyl it's the most underrated album it's maybe a bit for those who are critical of it it's maybe a bit too more it's, it's, it leans much into a very play it safe AOR, MOR, pop mainstream pop at least for Kate Bush you know for Kid push into this direction, you know, there's also a song which features Eric Clapton with lead guitar which and he plays exactly what you would expect from Eric Clapton in 1992 or 1993 to, to play on a track so it's not maybe the most wild or 
uh, experimental kind of album, but those are really nicely crafted, for the most part, pop songs. You know, it's really a pop album, and maybe that was a bit underwhelming after those big, very weird 80s albums where she, you know, put out masterpiece after masterpiece. Um, this is an excellent album, and the song I really like the songwriting on that album. And first and foremost, I often said it on this channel, I'm a fan of songwriting, you know, modern production. I'm a fan of good songwriting. This is great songwriting. Uh, number seven is her debut album, The Kick Inside. And maybe this is her most overrated album, but you know, there, there aren't really overrated Kipush albums. Like I said, I even love Lionheart. But you know, this is an album that maybe some would have in their top five, I don't know. Um, it's a debut album, of course, it has the, the big hit. Um, in this, with Kate Bush, that's really an appropriate way of, 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 of saying it, the big hit, Wandering Heights, which is also mentioned here. You know, it's a dreadful cover, it's by far her least, it's, uh, you know, it's her most dreadful album cover, let's face it. And even that hype stuff, that, 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 that really doesn't, you know, fit with what Kid Bush represents as an artist or would go on to represent as an artist with like this, including the hit single Watering Heights, that's a bit corny, but Watering Heights was, you know, in retrospect, uh, her biggest hit single ever, if you discount, you know, running up the till and all that, that, that story with Stranger Things and so on. But this was a number one single in early 1979, as her debut single, even before that album, and I think it was the first number one single by a female British artist, uh, at least self-penned, self-written uh, number one single, and a deserved number one single. You know, the record label, that was the first instance maybe where she really showed the world and the record label EMI that she's really a very independent spirit and wants to do what she wants to do. The record label wanted um, a different track as the first single, uh, James and the Cold Gun, and, you know, James and the Cold Gun is one of my least favorite Kate Bush songs. So they were so wrong. They, they misunderstood her in the beginning so much. And she was so right to, you know, fight for Watering Heights, which was, of course, much more like a Kate Bush mission statement. And James and the Cold Gun is one of the most conventional, you know, late 70s art rock, almost prog, pop, prog rock songs, um, to me nothing really special. But this is a great album, um, great tracks, moving, the opener is also a fantastic song, Damn Heavy People is a kind of a Kid Bush classic, um, yeah, lo lots of good songs, of course The Man with the Child in His Eyes, which is the earliest song of hers that was recorded. That was, you know, that song was recorded I think in 1975 or 1976, when she, um, you know, when she first, when she, after, after she was signed to EMI, um, but they, it still took like three more years until 1978 to really put out that album, but that track was already recorded in her first recording session with sound engineer Geoff Emmerich from, from the Beatle Glory Days. Um, was already recorded back then when she was like 14 or 15 years old so not only is she a genius she's also uh, like a, a child prodigy, a child genius at, at that time and she was uh, 19 years old when, when that album came out so great, amazing incredible uh, next album and from now on I, 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 re I even written it down so that I don't forget to mention it from now on, I consider all those top six albums masterpieces. This is not quite yet a masterpiece, though some Kate Bush fans, that's why I called it maybe overrated, some Kate Bush fans would also argue that this is a masterpiece. But I think there were still too much conventions put on her, uh, on this album. It could have been a masterpiece, but she wasn't yet there with, you know, with the production people and, and, and the musicians in, in, in the studio. But this is the first album where she really, also chronologically, because this is her third album from 1980, Never Forever, this is the first album where she at least has a co-production credit. After that she she really is produced by Kate Bush, every album, but this is like at least co-produced by Kate Bush. And that was really where she, for the first time, really could um, kind of, you know, fulfill her, her own vision, what, what she wanted to be. She want, she didn't want to be pigeonholed in this like sensitive um, 
Joni Mitchell kind of singer songwriter um, thing. Um, she wanted, um, yeah, she wanted her freedom and she wanted to do wild, sometimes experimental stuff. And this is the first time when where we get that. It still has a kind of a conventional art rock um, instrumentation, you know, guitar, electric guitar, bass, piano, drums. That's still that phase of her career, but it hints in this more uh, freer uh, direction. It has the big hit, again a song I wasn't, I was never really the biggest fan of, but I respect it of course as a big classic and hit, Babushka. I think it also starts off with Babushka. And uh, Breathing is another classic on this album, uh, masterpiece, I really love it. You know, if, if her career would have stopped after this, her third album, she would still be considered a uh, one of the greatest female artists of all time, probably, and this would, and you know, if she would have stopped after this album, this would be considered her big masterpiece. Um, but fortunately, she went on to do other things after that, and that's when her really, really great stuff happened. Um, the next in the list is my number five, of course. Like I said, if never forever, from now on, only masterpieces. This is. I used to have it higher, I used to have it, I think, as my number three, um, like one year ago, uh, if I would have ranked it then, uh, Ariel, uh, her comeback. Maybe I had it higher because it was the big comeback, uh, so maybe that, that influenced my, my thinking about this album. But, you know, really, now that I listened to all those albums chronologically uh, in, in a very short time span, I, I think that there are um, obviously uh, four albums I prefer to it, but again, it's a masterpiece, it's an incredible comeback uh, after 12 years, you know, Blood Red Shoes, this kind of play it safe mainstream album was 1993, and she returned in 2005 with one of her most daring and, and you know, experimental albums ever. It, 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 uh, it's a double album, first of all, not just on the vinyl, also on the CD, so very long. And the second half of that double album is uh, like a, mm, what do you call it? Not really a medley. It's 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 a concept, you know. She she also did this with with an album we will come to later. Um, but this is the second time she really had half a concept album. She never had a full concept album. She had two half concept albums. And before the dawn, you know, she performed those two concept sides in full length in these concerts, so she also performed live the, the A Sky of Honey side, which is, uh, yeah, which is a concept. And this album is, like many of her best albums, very seasonal, elemental album. And this is clearly a spring and summer album. I think I once ranked my favorite spring albums, and this must have been very high in, in my favorite spring albums, so I'm calling it a summer album, it's definitely spring, end or summer re, and that's also reflected in the lyrics, but also in the atmosphere, there's, um, you know, there's lots of field recording stuff, you know, birds uh, singing, birds chirping, and yeah, it's in, in like May or June, on a nice sunny blue sky day, um, this is really a very relaxing, but also artistically very satisfying album and fantastic production you know like i said she wasn't that satisfied afterwards with the with the with this this typical late 80s early 90s productions so she went in the complete opposite direction this sounds very warm very natural very also very analog in a way and fantastic fantastic album what what more can i say uh, the next album uh, number four you know now is winter. Um, if now would be summer, maybe Ariel would be number four and the album we're coming to now would be number five. But now is winter and I uh, listened to the albums last week. So, of course, uh, 50 Words for Snow is number four. Like, uh, you know, when Ariel is the, 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 the summer spring album, this is the, of course, the winter album. And this is probably the best concept album. I said she never really had a concept album. Okay, I, I, I was wrong. She has a concept album, and that's her. Con that's a complete concept album of about winter. And this is the best concept album that ever was made about winter, or maybe it's the best concept album ever made about any season. 
um, it's a concept album about winter and especially snow. Uh, I repeat myself, fantastic album. It has just seven or eight tracks. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven tracks, but also a double album because each of those tracks is like seven, eight, nine, ten minutes. It's very experimental. I think it's probably her most experimental non poppy album since The Dreaming from 1982. Um, and what, what an album. Um, it's mostly just her on piano. Uh, and I think she recorded the piano live in the studio in one consecutive, li like a live performance, you know, the complete album was, if, if that's true what I read, the complete album is her uh, in the studio playing without any, you know, interruption, the complete album on piano, like first take, and then she sang over it, and, uh, the, and, the, and the, the famous uh, studio drummer Stephen Gatt uh, flew in from America and played very tasteful jazzy drums, so it's really a very minimal approach. Um, there are some guest vocalists on on this album. Her, so, her son uh, Bertie, which uh, performs on Snowflake, which is a great opener. Uh, it's almost Radiohead, like Kid A Radiohead head, head face uh, like song, but I prefer it to anything Radiohead ever did. Um, there's uh, Elton John of all people. She's a big Elton John fan. Um, she also did once did a great cover of Rocket Man, for example. Also uh, Candle in the Wind. She did cover. Um, Elton John is a guest star on Snowed in at Wheeler Street. That's probably my favorite uh, song on that album. Song about reincarnation, and it's really I think no one ever wrote a song about reincarnation like this, and it's a very touching song about that concept. Yeah, it's a, Stephen Fry is also a guest star. Um, what a fantastic album. Uh, number three, I mentioned it like a minute ago, The Dreaming, maybe her most unconventional, at the time especially, unconventional album. But you know, what make, made this album unconventional upon release uh, soon turned conventional because this album in a way invented the 80s, you know, the whole 80s production wipe uh, something that some people can't stand but you know even if you can't stand it you have to respect her that she kind of she was like the first or one of the first who did this this you know programmed drums and i think the songs for this album were written also um, after the dreaming which was still in this band format this album was the first album she did uh, one of the first albums anyone did where she wrote the songs with the rhythm first you know she she programmed the uh, a drum pattern on, 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 on a synthesizer and and then she you know dream thought up the, the melodies over those those percussive elements and it's it's a wild ride it's, it's it's one of the weirdest albums you know it must have been very strange especially for people who were familiar with the first three kid bush albums when, when this came out in 1982 it also was kind of a flop compared with the three first albums critics didn't get it and the you know, the, the mainstream audience didn't really get it, but, you know, it has redeemed itself. It's, it's rightfully so now viewed as a big 80s classic and one of the most influential albums. But even if it would not have become inf an influential album, which that often doesn't mean that it's a good album, uh, this is also a very, very, very good album. It starts off with Set in Your Lab, one of the weirdest and also best songs ever. There Goes a Tanner is great, um, Houdini is great, Leave It Open, Suspended in Gaffer. My favorite track is Night of the Swallow, um, that, that should have been a single, maybe the album would have been a bit more successful at the time. With this as a single, I think that would have been an obvious single from that album, but never was a single. Uh, but yeah, what an album. Uh, and now number two and one, um, number, you know, those first, those top two albums are two of my all-time favorite albums ever. Uh, and it starts off with The Sensual World, one of the two albums she wasn't, at least with the production, too happy about afterwards. So she redid them for, for director's cut. But I always preferred these versions, and this is, like I said, one of my all-time favorite albums. It's really an album album, you know, an, an album experience. It's not really an album packed with hits. My number one album is an album packed with hits, for example. This is really, uh, I think you have to listen to it from track one on side one to uh, the last track on side two, which is 
This Woman's Work, one of her biggest classics. Um, but not my favorite song on that album. You know, my favorite songs on that album are The Sand, Soul World and The Fog. Um, you know, the ambience, you know, those are ambient songs, I would say, you know, you know great. She yeah, often had those Irish folklore elements there here, but also great string arrangements on that album. Plus, um, there's this Bulgarian vocal group, um, I think Trio Bulgaka, they are called, you know, three Bulga Bulgarian singers, um, which have a very special, you know, add a special folklore feel to that album. Uh, it's, yeah, it's really uh, an experience, that album, and especially on vinyl, I think. This is an album that sounds... The Dreaming and The Sensual World are both albums I really prefer. I have them also on, on CD. I really, really, really prefer the early pressings or maybe first pressing vinyl versions of these albums. You know, it's really fantastic production, in my opinion. You know, she didn't... Afterwards, allegedly, she didn't like the production on The Sensual World. I think it's, it's a perfectly produced album. And my number one is... Of course, uh, it was also in my video of my top 10 favorite albums of all time. I think I ranked it number six or seven. And maybe uh, I wasn't, maybe I should have been even been more generous when I did that ranking. It's probably, really, it's probably more like a top five of all time album for me. And my number one, two, and three favorite albums are all by the same band, by the Beatles. So this is probably one of the two or three. One of my two or three favorite albums of all time that are not by the Beatles is The Hounds of Love, of course. Um, what can I say about this album? This is a perfect album. The first sight um, could be like greatest hits of Kate Bush. First sight, you know, if you put out a greatest hits album by Kate Bush, that could also be the first sight of this album. You know, hits, 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 running up the hill, Hounds of Love, and my favorite uh, Kate Bush song. Uh, cloud busting. It's maybe my maybe this is also my favorite song in general of all time by anyone, especially the live version, like I said, of For the Dawn, but also the studio version. A uh, very moving song. And the second side is like a already um, hinted at with Ariel um, half a concept album. This time the concept is called The Ninth Wave. And it's a concept um, that again that she uh, redid or did. For this performance, um, it's a concept about someone, her, you know, Kate, lost at sea. The character she plays, lost at sea. Uh, it's incredible, and uh, from this concept side, um, the track "Hello Earth" is to me like the climax, and it, that's also one of the most moving and, but also one of the most eerie songs I I ever heard. And one of my again, one of my all-time favorite songs by anyone. Yeah, one of the, maybe maybe the best album of the 80s. I think ABC's Lexicon of Love is also almost as good or as good, but this has to be one of my one or two favorite albums of the 80s, one of my top 10, maybe even top 5 favorite albums of all time. And fantastic album, beginning till end. First side, the pop hits, and second side, the weird experimental concept. Uh, Kate Bush. Fantastic artist, fantastic career, and I, you know, I, I'm really, really, really looking looking forward to her forthcoming studio album. Hopefully next year. Thank you for watching. Until next time, goodbye.